this program has already generated a, a return of $1.66 per participant for every dollar invested in the program. That's a pretty spectacular result. It's remarkable to people who have been in the trenches of social programs and social welfare and all the argumentation about how much society should be spending to help address poverty. It's, it's heartening because here's the, one of the most costly programs that's been tested, and it's proving to be highly beneficial to society in, in financial terms. David Yoakum here. Employment opportunities for young people without a college degree, which is millions of Americans, continues to get worse. Failing to connect with meaningful work early on in your career can lead to a lifetime of disadvantages. Higher risk of substance abuse, poor health, child abuse and neglect, and intergenerational poverty, just to name a few. What can we do to bridge this opportunity gap and help young adults who don't have a college degree find meaningful work? The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and APT Associates just released the five-year results from a major randomized control trial evaluating the effectiveness of a program called Year Up. Year Up is a unique program. It provides young adults who have a weak connection to the labor force with six months of full-time training and then a six-month internship. They get paid throughout it all. It's intensive. It's time-consuming. It's expensive. Does it work? What's the cost-benefit analysis? We're joined today by David Fine, a principal at APT Associates and one of the lead investigators on the Year Up evaluation. We cover a lot of ground in this podcast. First, we unpack what all is entailed in Year Up. Who does it serve? What's the curriculum? How do the internships work? What does it take to implement? Next, we get into the evaluation design, including details about the randomized methodology and the relied upon administrative data. And then, of course, the results. What did they find? What did they not find? And what about the nuances of thinking through the cost-benefit analyses? We end by talking about what it would take to scale the program across the entire country. And I asked David what he hopes happens next as a result of this milestone report. Welcome to 30,000 Leagues. David Fine, welcome to the 30,000 Leagues podcast. Thank you very much. So the Europe project is, this is a big project. I'm excited to talk to you about it, but there's a lot of moving parts here. It's been something in the works for, for over half a decade, at least. So I'll ask you a little bit about the real backstory here. My thought to put a little bit of structure around this conversation, particularly for listeners who, who maybe haven't heard of the program before, is to first ask you to give just kind of a minute or two high level overview of what Europe is, the main finding, and then we can do sort of a second wave through and ask a lot of more follow-up questions about the structure of the program, its aims, the methods of the evaluation, and really get into the details. Sure, uh, happy to. Europe is a national organization, and it, all, it runs a program, actually multiple programs, that are usually referred to as Europe as well. So I'll go back and forth a little bit. But we evaluated the original version of Europe's program, which is a one-year program full-time program for young adults uh, aged 18 to 24 with high school diplomas. It operates in eight cities. It's a freestanding program, meaning that Europe staff, young adults come to the program location and Europe staff deliver all, all the services. The first half of the year is spent in an intensive training environment on, on the premises where Europe staff provide very carefully structured training and uh, technical skills and communication, written, written skills, as well as importantly, soft skills or what Europe calls professional skills. And this, this training is very immersive. Europe is using a lot of best practices uh, like learning communities and they have a behavior contract that's tied to uh, fairly generous stipends that Europe provides. So they're really working hard at creating an immersive peer environment and helping to support the development of behaviors that are, that are helpful in a professional work setting. In the second um, part of the program, Europe, Europe participants go into internships, which are a full-time work situation with a major company, often for a Fortune 500 company like Google or Salesforce or Bank of America, where they're actually doing 
entry-level work in the occupational sectors that Europe targets, namely IT and financial services. At the end of the six months, during which interns are supported by Europe staff who monitor closely and interact with work supervisors, there's a concerted effort to help place participants in jobs and good entry-level jobs with with a good living wage that could be a a starting point in in a career. Perhaps IT or financial services, or perhaps an occupation in which those skills are very important. So that's the that's the, that's the basic program. It's very intensive, comprehensive, full-time, and there's a, a obviously just a ton of wrinkles about it. We began uh, a partnership with Europe through a larger research study called Pathways to Advancing Careers in Education that's being sponsored by the Federal Administration for Children and Families. And through that project in roughly 2010, we started a partnership with Europe and entered into a collaborative process of, of doing a random assignment study, this program that I just described. So we can get into details of the design as, as you wish, but the, the upshot is that we're now just on the point of releasing five-year follow-up results, which capture impacts on earnings and education and other aspects of life over five years since young adults entered the program um, and since a a randomly assigned comparison group also began to be in our sites for measurement. So that's that's a high level view of of, of what we're doing and happy to happy to get into the details or talk about other aspects. Great. Thanks for that David. Yeah let's 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 loop back and go through a few of the things a little bit more slowly. So Europe is a program that is targeted for disconnected youth. Who, who should we be imagining here? Who, who are disconnected youth? What are some of the unique challenges that they face? Well, this population is generally an urban population. It, it's a high representation of minority youth. And these are young adults who typically have struggled in uh, school, both in high school and in many cases in college. And I've had difficulty succeeding for a variety of reasons, whether they be poor, poor preparation in terms of academic skills or, and or often a surrounding difficulties in life associated with poverty. So it is a high poverty population and Europe is also screening this population to find kids who are, who are motivated and who really want to get ahead, but for lack of opportunity, haven't been able to. So that's, that's who that that's who they're uh, who they're targeting. And as a term of art, I usually understand it as people that are sixteen to twenty four, and they're not in school, and they also aren't employed. Yes, the term disconnection, which which you mentioned, is a kind of a general concept for Europe. Disconnection isn't an isn't really an either or thing, although you can measure, and there's a variety of ways of measuring it. Um, Europe target population includes young adults who would meet an official definition of disconnection, i.e. they're not in school, neither in school nor working, and perhaps haven't been for the past, some past period. But it also includes young adults who have recently been in school or maybe who are currently holding a low-wage job, a part-time job, maybe even a full-time job. So the the concept I like uh, to use for Europe is that it's targeting a population that's at risk of disconnection uh, or disconnected. The good thing about that that more flexible concept is that you're able to work with young adults who may not have gotten to a point um, in their lives where they're in such dire straits that they're going to need a lot of other help before they would be ready for a program uh, like like Europe. And the Europe program itself has a number of different components to it. Can you describe the structure of the Europe experience for a participant? Sure. Earlier, I mentioned this first, this initial six-month training period where 
Europe, but students are in, in Europe offices, which are set up as very nice professional environments. It really feels like a work setting. There's computer labs, there's really good meeting space, there's staff offices. And in a typical week, they're going through a very highly structured set of activities, which include formal courses, formal classes. There's, as I mentioned, the, th the three classes. There's a class in technical skills, which may involve IT or financial services. There are classes in what Europe uh, calls business communication, which is essentially preparation for college level English, but is done in a, in a way that really emphasizes work skills, email, you know, professional speaking and so forth. And then there's a Europe signature course in so-called professional skills, which is soft skills, really, really intensively and purposefully crafted to equip young adults to know how to manage, navigate the social environment and the um, work, ex the ex behavioral expectations to do well in, in, a, in a professional work setting. So in a typical week, they have a schedule of classes in all three of these courses. And then there are some group activities. Every mo Monday morning starts with a um, Monday morning check-in because Europe has learned that over the weekend, a lot of stuff happens and it's really important to have that purposeful time to really calibrate. During the week, there are s sessions informal and, and, and planned with coaches. Every Europe staff member, regardless of what their full-time responsibility is, serves as a coach to one or more Europe student and sort of has a responsibility for checking in with them and has sort of a, a, a repertoire of kinds of supports that they provide. If and when Europe students need more help or have emergencies come up, the Staff also includes uh, social workers who are equipped to counsel and make referrals to resources in the community. Uh, could be a problem with homelessness and a need for housing. Could be a domestic violence problem. Could be substance abuse. Then at every Friday morning is devoted to a series of activities called Friday Feedback, which is a group meeting of the whole learning community that involves sort of debriefing on what happened during the week and a structured exchange in which students provide feedback to one another and, and to staff. So it's a, it's a multi-directional structured feedback process where using a very a sort of purposeful approach to feedback, students learn how to give and receive, uh, receive feedback. During the week, they're earning, Europe calls it earning a stipend because this is part of sort of simulating a work environment. The stipends can reach as much as something like $8,000 a year. So it's, it's a substantial amount of money to help support, not, not enough to, to live on, but enough to help um, meet needs that might otherwise make participation, full-time participation in this program impossible. There's a behavior contract that each student signs in which certain requirements for attendance, uh, dress, professional dress, demeanor, there's a no cell phone during class rule. Violations of any of these you know, explicitly stipulated rules it can generate reductions in stipends. So there's teeth to that. When those reductions can progress to the point that they, that they completely zero out the stipend, and at that point, the student is asked to leave the program. So that's the that's the basic structure of the first six of, of the first six months. And the internship is sort of a different setup, which I can talk about if you're if you'd like me to. I would definitely like you to. I'll just note though that the opening six months is. I mean, it strikes me as pretty unique in its comprehensiveness, its intensity. I mean, students are full-time every day of the week they're taking classes they're having conversations with peers they're signing behavioral contracts they're getting paid that 150 dollars a week stipend how unusual is this sort of intensity of supports and training relative to other kinds of programs that are out there well that's a great question it is unusual there are other programs that are full-time and immersive but very few that include 
all those elements at, at quite that level. And it's, a, it's an important question because if we are looking at the kinds of programs that are generating the best impacts in this field, we tend to find that they are the full-time programs that are more immersive. That said, full, having a program that is full-time and immersive is, is not necessarily a guarantee that you're going to generate impacts like Europe's, but it, it seems to be an, an important element. And there's lots of reasons to not be surprised that this would be helpful given all the disadvantages and sort of the, the water under the bridge that's already flowed for these young adults. It's not going to be an easy, quick um, process to get the kinds of skills and, and make the kinds of connections that, that one would expect would be needed to do well in a professional uh, work environment. Six months is really not that long. I mean, say compared to four years of, of, of college. Right, right. How does how do students tend to do? Do most of them finish the program? Are there a lot of folks that are having challenges showing up or having those behavioral infractions that you were describing? Well, that that's an interesting question also. On the one hand, an amazingly high percentage of the students do get sanctioned for violations of the behavioral rules. And and lose sometimes substantial portions of their stipends. Most of the offices had ways that over time you could earn back points lost. But that said, the strong supports in what Europe calls a high support, high expectations model are such that Europe is able to provide the attention to individual situations that are needed to help a young adult stay, stay in the program. So this program had a 75% uh, completion rate of the one-year program, which given this program's intensity and requirements is, is phenomenal. It, it's quite an achievement, which is a testimony to the supports that, that Europe provided and also likely to the care that goes into selecting young adults who are motivated to do well. And just to say a word about that selection process, Europe has a very purposefully sort of experience-based process for choosing young adults. What it's looking for is it's looking for people who need help. Europe knows that they're going to struggle to do well because of the personal and family um, issues that I mentioned uh, a while back, but who don't have the kinds of insurmountable challenges that, uh, that Europe just uh, couldn't help with in, 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 in the space of time and resources that it has. So it's, in addition to the supports, it's it, the success in, in generating these high retentions is also related to careful selection of young adults who are a good fit to the program. And the selection criteria here strike me as, as pretty stringent. I mean, something only like 16% of, of applicants, if I recall, were actually admitted. What, could you say a little bit more about like the, the kinds of things that are, you know, issues that are just outside the scope of what Europe is able to provide just to help us think about the kinds of individuals that are going to need something else beyond, you know, that Europe can't provide? Sure. Before answering that directly, I, I, I would like to qualify that a fair amount, we, we don't know exactly how much, but a, a fair amount of the selection, the winnowing in selection that you just mentioned is, is related to young adults not having a high school degree or just not being, not, not being able to get to the office and things, things like that. That said, Europe has, as I mentioned, a very intensive screening process. And that process is a process that involves considering students' goals, their experience, how they present themselves. And it's a fairly long and multi-step process that involves an application. You come to an open house, you meet and greet, then you put in, and, and then you come back for individual interviews and group, sort of group situations are created with other students where staff are seeing how students 
work together and how they think about tasks that are tests and problems. There's probably a certain amount that is being identified just by the, the fact that students are able to decide to stay in the game through this, through this process so that by the end, if they'd come back for the two or three times that and, and gotten through everything and you know they've written a little essay that seems like a promising statement of interest and intent, that's, that's going to be taken into consideration too. So it's not a scientific formula. It's not a, it's not a recipe for a very, you know, a very highly specified set of criteria, but they're measuring a lot during this process. And at the end, a committee of Europe admissions staff is looking at each applicant and kind of talking through the pros and the cons in relation to what the program has to offer by way of supports and also who else is in the mix for a given uh, class. Did you yourself attend any of the sessions or visit any of the Europe sites and just get a feel for the room, the people, and just from a personal perspective? Absolutely. And I'd encourage anybody who is interested in this program to contact Europe and express interest in that, including you. I have sat in on classes. I've had lunch with students. I've been part of these sessions, on these Friday feedback sessions. And the fabric of the program is immediately apparent when you are in these situations. You know that you're in a place where stuff is happening, where there's a, a lot of energy. There's a lot of interest and skill and capacity to engage people who are in, in the environment. You see students in the halls talking, walking, thinking, very absorbed in what they're doing. You see employers on, on the premises doing workshops and interacting with students. And the, the lunches were actually probably the most interesting parts of parts of the visits because anytime a student has 30 seconds with you as an outside visitor professional you see how well they're equipped to pepper you with questions and to introduce themselves and make eye contact and shake your hand and it's very heartening it's a very heartening and impressive sort of spun not spontaneous, but and not unrehearsed, but very credible sort of performance of the kinds of social skills that we read about and we talk about in the field. The instructors and also the just the various advisors and mentors that are a part of Europe, who who are these individuals? What are the kinds of backgrounds they're coming from? How are they being found to to be recruited into the effort? I would say there's sort of two themes in, in what Europe is looking for in its instructors and staff, maybe three. Above all, passion and compassion. They really want to make a difference. They really want to be in and help this community. Two, they have to be non-traditional instructors. They have to understand and be competent in the skills and repertoire of sort of this newer, newer body of, of, of thought about pedagogy and working with non-traditional students. And in fact, you know, the pedagogy is equally at least as applicable to the traditional students, but it, it's about contextualizing what you're teaching to make sure it's useful in the real world. So, so it's about being comfortable letting students lead a class. It's about Pro, it's about understanding and being able to do good project-based active learning. So from the teach, and, and as, as we know, not all teachers are uh, comfortable or, or, or familiar or trained in those methods, but this is not uh, stand in front of the class and lecture for an hour and take questions at the end. It's, it's, it's sort of the flipped version of the class where students are preparing, they have homework and they come in and it's active hands-on they're building, they're creating, they're talking, they're analyzing, and so on. And to be a, a teacher, to be able to guide that kind of, of a learning experience is not uh, something that everyone is going to have. So Europe, Europe, Europe looks for that. The third thing is that Europe 
often, but not always, is looking for teachers who bring industry experience. So often, for example, the IT instructors will be people who have been actually doing IT work in an IT environment and you know, decided that they would take a pay cut <laughs> in, in order to you know, do something socially worthwhile. That answer mostly describes the instructors that Europe is, is using, but the other staff, other kinds of staff specialties to varying degrees have these same, these same qualities. An interesting sort of emphasis at the, at the management level of, of these of, of Europe local programs is that they are more explicitly looking for industry experience and experience from the business world. Um, so that contributes to what is the very entrepreneurial environment in these programs. So we've got this cohort of young adults. They finished high school, but they're, they're disconnected or at risk of being disconnected in terms of not having a job or being in school. They've gone through six months of really rich training in terms of technical skills, practice in public speaking and writing, various social supports. I mean, pay to stipend every week while they're doing this. Let's go down to the second half of the program. What happens after they finish with these trainings? Yeah, so they finish the training. There's, there's a celebration of that. Every young adult who completes the first six months is guaranteed an internship. And there's a process of matching interns to companies and to particular kinds of, of slots. And after that, they go to work at, at the companies full-time most of the five days of the week. On Wednesday afternoon, it was Wednesdays, it may be different uh, now, they come um, back to Europe and have workshops and debrief and get sort of coaching and, and, and things that come up as well as sometimes they sit in on classes that are oriented towards new technical or, or non-technical skills. At the employer, there's a variety of different kinds of internship experiences. And one of the sort of fascinating areas where it would be really interesting to do really a separate, even a separate research project is to look at the, and try to understand the variety of practices that employers um, use. Europe um, doesn't prescribe the way employers must conduct and structure these internships. They provide ideas and support and they introduce, they have or typically orient the workplace supervisor managers to Europe and to kind of what to expect from Europe students and what not to expect. From there though, the company, each company sort of has a somewhat different uh, approach. There are best practices for internships in a, in a separate project for the Department of Education. We studied, we studied a variety of things and one of them was the internship component. We sort of thought, thought about best practices and looked at some of the variation. So the, the things that come up that are good are a good internship exposes young adults to different parts of the, of the company. It will rotate them through different roles and introduce them to a variety of, of staff and work experiences. While typically, while typically having interns working at a particular job, sometimes it will be one job for the whole six months. Like it could be, for example, IT help desk for all the whole time, or it could be rotating through a series of different jobs in different uh, offices with different staffs. So best practices in, include this sort of uh, social dimension of making sure that the interns meet and are welcome and supported and get to know a variety of different staff, including uh, senior managers who often take a, a real substantial interest in this program and, and in the students and uh, develop relationships, mentoring re relationships that uh, often continue after after the program. One of the one of the sort of things to watch if you're running an internship in a in a company like this is you want to minimize downtime because often when there's interns in a, in a big busy company who aren't being paid a regular salary, if you don't make careful provisions for supervision, interns can find themselves twiddling their thumbs too much 
and that can be depressing and not not beneficial. So when that becomes an issue, you can you can work with Europe students on sort of self-initiated solutions to downtime, and you can give supervisors ideas about how to how to give students a good mix of things to do. So they go through these six-month internships, and at the end, there's no expectation or requirement to hire interns at the company. Some employers are very purposefully looking and working with Europe against that expectation. They're really looking for smart, good, uh, motivated uh, entry-level talent. And some aren't. Some are, at least in the version of the program that we study, some are primar- Some employers are primarily in it because the, uh, they want to um, do something for the community and, and help, help these young adults. But that's so, so we can we can talk more about about the outcomes. I mean, that expectation for whether the internship is meant to be an on ramp to a permanent job does that does just strike me as a important feature. And I can imagine that students really care a lot about that dynamic. Is this something that's discussed upfront and clear about whether the internship is you know kind of a interview of sorts for a permanent position versus knowing ahead of time that they're going to need to go elsewhere after it's done? I think that it's made clear to students that the internship may or may not lead to a job. A lot of the intern relationships are with companies who've had prior Europe interns. So there's a certain amount of intelligence about the likelihood that jobs will be in the offing in general. And, and so I expect that for the most part, students have a pretty good idea of, the, of, of what the prospects are. But they also know that it's really up to them and it's up to the workplace supervisors to decide whether it's a good fit, whether they would be happy there and whether they would be doing work that the company would would value. And a really important detail here, which I know we'll get back into in, in more detail when we talk about the cost benefit analysis, is that the employers are paying. Actually, the majority of the expenses for year up is employer provided. I think that's, that's their salary mostly. Is that the 220 a week stipend that's coming from the employer? Or are they paying for more beyond that? The way it works is, is, is that employers pay a per capita fee to year up for each intern. It's, and year up then provides a st- that fee goes into general program revenue and which is then used to pay the weekly stipend. So it's really year up who sets the tone with respect to this stipend being salary like that in fact the stipend is begins in the first 6 months of the program and goes throughout. So the employer payment which uh, covers about close to 60% of the program's cost is used to cover these stipends, but also it's used to cover your up staff salaries and other, other parts of the program. And this yearly stipend that you get as a student, it's something like, was it something like $9,000 if I Yeah, it's 8,000. 8, 8, yeah, so that's like half of what you would get if you had a, you know, 750 an hour minimum wage job annual. Right. But of course, you're also getting all of these additional trainings and supports and things as a part of the experience. Thanks for the overview of the program itself. Let's come now to the evaluation, which is one of the really key roles that you've had is asking the question about what impacts the program has had. Maybe maybe first say, say a little bit about the, the primary outcomes that we care about here, and then I'll tee you up to talk about the method you use to measure those outcomes. Sure. Well, Outcomes in a study like this are and should be aligned to what sort of the primary goal of, of, of the program that you're studying. In this case, it's very explicitly to generate good career track employment opportunities and ultimately earnings, decent earnings. So we in this study have to, do, as a sort of a, a matter of, of kind of keeping the research disciplined and, and above board, declare at the outset uh, before we even look at any of the results, what what are our criteria for success going to be? So for this study, the primary criteria uh, for success is earnings. And we, for each round of analysis, we specify particular intervals of exposure 
that is number, amount of time since random assignment, that we're looking at earnings. And we have to declare that in writing to, to intermediary groups that register outcomes to keep research projects above board. So the outcome for the current study was quarterly earnings, I think, at the end of the third year of, of a follow-up in a couple of quarters around that. So how did you set up the method to measure? Well, there's the random assignment piece, and then there's the actual, how do we measure earnings after random assignment? We basically built a randomization process on top of Europe's existing recruitment procedures. So at the point that Europe had deemed a, a group of young adults eligible for its program, we then brought in an uh, automated random assignment uh, lottery process that identified randomly one group that would go to Europe and another group that would not be able to go to Europe, but can get go to community college or other, other services in the community. And then both of these groups, we follow our part of the study and we measure outcomes and compare the average levels of outcomes on earnings and some other things over increasing amounts of time. So this is, a, this is the gold standard method for measuring impacts because it, it, it addresses the key problem in figuring out whether a program has actually caused outcomes to be better. And it's the only and the best way to really get a hold of causality in, in these kinds of studies. Which data source did you use for the wage information? So for the wage information, the primary data source is records, wage records that are actually collected from employers uh, through the unemployment insurance system. Every state collects mandates, employers reporting of wage records on a quarterly basis. And then fortunately, ACF, Office of Child Supportment, Support, Child Support Enforcement, has a database that collects, aggregates all the state data so that we have a national database that we can then match our sample to and get a complete, very complete record of earnings over um, the follow be preceding and, and over the follow-up period. That said, we also do follow-ups, have been doing a series of follow-up surveys where we measure outcomes, including earnings and employment in finer grain than these aggregated aggregated wage records do. So we know we can get into more of the richness of, of what, how employment and employment experiences are changing than the records alone will allow. And the study involves some 2,500 plus or minus a few individuals across nine different cities starting back in 2013. How do you think about that sample? Like what's, what's the population here? You know, my rough cut at this at first is thinking about the 4.3 million young adults who are disconnected writ large. But as you talked about before, this program is not for, for, for just any disconnected. You do quite a lot of screening. How many folks do you think are out across the country that would be eligible for, for year up? It's a difficult question because we've not been able to measure exactly what a fraction of the overall population Europe is serving. Earlier, you mentioned that we report selection of about one in six applicants, but the applicants are self-selected. As best we can tell, I mean, there have been studies of the disconnected population. One estimates that something like half have high school credentials. So potentially half of the national population. I mean, right now estimates are, even before the pandemic, it was probably something like six, six million disconnected. Maybe half of them would have high school credentials. But as I said earlier, this really is the concept, operative concept is really more one of at risk of disconnection. So when you think about the larger population that's trying school, trying work, you know, having periods of low wage employment and sort of has sort of minimal attachment or partial attachment, Europe is really kind of operating necessarily in that larger vein. So on the one hand, it's, it's selective. On the other hand, there's potentially a larger population that, that are eligible. So what impact on wages did you find for participants in Europe? So it is a pretty outstanding result that the study 
has has produced. And I, I think maybe just to sort of summarize or capture it in in kind of one of the series of outcomes, let's take the fifth year of the of our current five year observation window. And in the fifth year, the treatment group's average wages uh, earnings were eight thousand dollars higher than the control groups. That's about a thirty four percent impact. We see this level of impact begin in the immediately in the year after the program, which is when you'd expect to see it, the second year, second follow-up year. It is immediately large and the impact is sustained through the end of the five-year period, unlike a lot of studies where programs generate shorter-lived earnings boosts and the control group often catches up. Just to put a little bit more numbers in our minds as we're talking about this, the annual wage for someone in the control group on average was what? And then what did it go up to for those who went through year up? In year five, in year, in year five, the average control group member was making about $23,000 in the year. The, the, the treatment group member was making 31000 How does that boost compare to other job programs that are out there? Well, this is, the, this is in absolute, as, as a number, the largest number that has ever been found for a workforce uh, training program evaluated in a random assignment uh, study. The, there are other programs that have generated impacts of maybe five, $6,000 a year at their best. So it compares very well. And I must say as a, as a careful researcher that the difference between those estimates is not statistically significant, but all the, all the point estimates are statistically significant. So for example, the Perscolis, a wonderful program with many similarities to Europe, generates a five or six thousand dollar impact that's statistically significant. Project Quest generates a five thousand dollar annual earnings impact that's statistically significant. And our eight thousand dollar impact is is significant. But sampling variation doesn't allow you to say that the differences across studies are statistically significant. What's driving this increase in, in wages? I guess part of my intuition was expecting to see, you know, big bumps in the number of folks that were actually just outright unemployed going down. My understanding from reading this is that you're not seeing big shifts in the unemployment rate, but it's more, a little bit more subtle in terms of the types of jobs, the hourly ways that they're getting, the number of hours they're working. Could you kind of unpack those, those details behind this difference a little bit? Yeah, sure. There's a, a couple of points here. In general, both groups, both the treatment and the control group members are working. The treatment group member is, is somewhat more likely to be working full-time. So in part, we've got an effect on earnings of greater work hours. The largest component of the impact is coming from an increase in hourly wages, though. On average, it's, it's $3 uh, an hour uh, higher. And that is a reflection of the fact that the jobs that Europe treatment group members got were in higher, higher wage occupations like IT and, 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 and banks and, finan and other financial services. So another, another sort of aspect or part of the answer to that question is that a lot of Europe's impact was generated by successful internship outcomes. So a lot of the, though not everybody was hired, not all the treatment group members were hired through their internships. As I said earlier, there's no requirement to hire. It's a part of the way the program works, but it's the ones that were hired who are generating, generating most of the impact. My understanding is that Wages for an individual went up, but their average household income didn't necessarily increase when you're comparing the treatment and control group, I guess, offset by reduced public benefits and things like that. Is that first, just let me just confirm that I'm right about that, that household incomes didn't seem to get boosted by the program. And then curious how you think about that in relation to the overall value of the, the program to an individual participant. Well, let me answer by starting 
with the point that personal income went way up, as you'd expect. And it was interesting to see that average household income did not. We didn't analyze this in great detail, but the two explanations that seem most likely are, one, that there seems to have been an increased tendency of treatment group members to live separately. So when you, you know, having more space and not living with your parents or, or maybe even not living with a boyfriend or, or girlfriend who you're not getting along with that well, it's a lot easier when you've got the resources to afford another apartment. So in fact, we see a somewhat higher likelihood of young women to not be living with a spouse. And we see a somewhat higher likelihood of young men not to be living with their parents at home. So once you're in a situation that's a smaller household, there's less income. And so partly what we're, what we're finding here may be a reflection of effects on household composition, but we haven't. And, and then part of it may be that, as you, as you said, with, with increases in, in household income, there's decreases in, in benefit eligibility. So that's, that's a great question for future research. And y'all spend a lot of time in their report doing a careful cost benefit analysis because the program, which maybe isn't surprising when you think about just how rich it is and the stipends and all the different assets is, is expensive, almost $29,000 per participant. How does the cost benefit analysis play out? So the cost benefit analysis here is really important and really interesting because as you say, this is an relatively expensive program. It's one of the more expensive programs uh, out there. And it's a lot more expensive than the level of investment that major US workforce training programs like we are and, and, and elsewhere or what you can get through TANA. So it's a pretty high bar to generating financial benefits against that kind of investment that will justify the, the costs in, in the cost benefit framework. So it's quite remarkable that the large impacts on earnings that I was talking about a minute ago, primarily are responsible, are large enough to be driving benefits on other things like reduced welfare payments, the value of fringe benefits that go along with those earnings, the additional contributions to the tax base from having more taxpayers and more tax paying going on as a result of increased earnings. All those benefits, when you add them up, outweigh the costs of this very expensive program. Just normally in a cost benefit analysis, in eventually we will be projecting the benefits over participants' lifetimes. That's the way you normally do a benefit cost analysis. But at this juncture, we're, we've stopped at five years because the study is ongoing and we'll get, we'll get to the longer term <laughs> in the longer term. But at this point, even over the first five years that we've, we've assessed in the cost-benefit study, this program has already generated a, a return of $1.66 per participant for every dollar um, invested in the program. So that's a pretty spectacular result, as you were as as you were suggesting, and I I think it's 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 remarkable to people who have been in the trenches of social programs and social welfare and all the argumentation about how much you should be spending, how much society should be spending to help address poverty. It's it's heartening because here's the one of the most costly programs that's been tested, and it's proving to be highly highly beneficial to society in, in financial terms. Remarkable effect size here from a rigorous RCT is, you know, is one of the reasons I reached out to you right away when I saw the study. Now, the cost benefit analysis, this is taking a society wide look. And as you noted, it, most of the benefits are accruing to the individual participant, which is great. But the program reminded ourselves that it's being primarily funded by the employers themselves. Philanthropy is putting in a big chunk of the cost coverage here as well. Hone in a little bit on the employer. Are they actually getting a positive return on investment for what they're putting into the program? This is a really important question. Our study, we didn't design the study 
to measure the return on employers' investments. So in our analysis, we did what economists often do, and that is look at different assum- look at different assumptions and discuss the reasonableness of those assumptions. But a a full blown a full blown uh, ROI ROI study would be would be really useful to do. In our in our base case, we assume that if employer puts $16,000 into Europe's internship program, we assume they only get $8,000, half of that back in value. And we assume that employers might, from qualitative interviews, employers are investing in Europe for a mix of, of reasons. And as I said earlier, including they want to be responsible companies and they want to give back to the community and not necessarily looking for a uh, narrow financial return, but also potentially because there are quite tangible and immediate demonstrable benefits, which would include the monetary value of the work that interns do during internships. They're working hard. They're doing jobs often that the company might be paying a regular employee more to do, say, manning a help desk or you know, processing loans. But then particularly, there is likely to be great value from having a cost-effective pipeline for hiring really well-motivated, well-prepared new employees that you've actually had a chance to try out for six months and get to, and, and get to know. These hiring costs for employers are among the bigger costs that they face. And when you talk to employers, you quickly learn that it's also one of the one of the biggest pain points and sources of headaches, because normally hiring entry-level professional settings involves a tremendous amount of risk-taking and uncertainty. You're looking and seeing, do they have a BA or you know, what's their education level? And a ton of the screening is being done at the outset without really knowing, without even seeing anybody. Then you see them, you talk to them for an hour, and you take a, you know, you, you maybe you talk to a couple of references. The, Net result is that employers tell you that this process doesn't work very well and that it's very costly both to run the recruitment process and to live with the consequences because a lot of the new hires do not work out. They either leave soon or, or they stay and they're not uh, as productive as, as employers would, would, would have wished. Ideally, what Europe is offering and by, by you know, anecdotal report, Europe is providing a cost, a very cost-effective alternative to developing a reliable pipeline to new talent. So those are potentially very large returns, financial returns to em- employers. And Europe has worked with, with employers and some, and some consulting entities to work up some back of the envelope estimates of what, what the savings are, or, but the general the general suspicion is that when you do this well, you can be offering employers a lot of return on their buck. That is why in our analysis, we look not only at an assumed 50% return, but we look at what would happen on the one end if employers got no return uh, from this investment, which is very unlikely, but you know, might be the situation if government uh, was going to entirely fund the program and you know, there wasn't the same kind of set, set up. At the other end, we looked at what would happen if employers got the, the total value of their investment back plus 15% because it's a better strategy. They're saving money. And it, under all three assumptions, which I'm pretty comfortable covered the gamut, maybe returns could be higher than you know, 115%. But it all th- under all three assumptions, this program is cost beneficial in, the, in just the first five years. So that's that's a happy news on the employer front. It's, it's quite plausible that a company investing in a year uh, participant is going to help their bottom line, at least in terms of the return on in financial investment. But but let's let's say it turns out that that's not the case. You're still showing society wide positive benefits. If if it turned out that it wasn't positive ROI for employers, and let's say that. In theory, just pure altruism wasn't enough to get them to continue to invest in it. How do you think the program should be financed instead? And particularly thinking about trying to scale it further, assuming that, I'm assuming that's one of the things you're going to be advocating from the findings so far. 
How do you make the financing work to scale it? I think it would be a mistake to not require employer financing because that part of the model is probably responsible for generating a lot of the good earnings outcomes that, that we're seeing. Employers having skin in the game is a great in, in, in incentive for them to really look after these young adults and think about their responsibilities seriously. That said, if the effectiveness of the program wouldn't be changed, was a similar with these without the employer, say you had the internships, but employers didn't have to pay into them, and say government covered the whole cost, you would have a program that would on net be beneficial uh, to society. So I think a better way to go, which I uh, recommend in a white paper that I, I just wrote, is to keep something like half of the financial costs covered by employers through this kind of a mechanism. And instead of covering the rest through philanthropy as it currently is, that would be a great role for big federal spending. Because right now, philanthropy is hard to scale. Europe has done a terrific job in, in, in developing a relatively large program for one organization. Before the pandemic, it was serving something like three, 4,000 young adults a year. But there's hundreds of thousands, millions, as we were saying before, who might benefit from a program like this. And when you get into that level of spending, you got you to gotta think about government. So I think it would be a very, very good investment on the taxpayers' side to support if the federal government um, were to be able to take on the roughly half of Europe's costs that were are currently covered by philanthropy, and then and then work with Europe and other providers to scale the program up um, substantially. The scaling, I'm, I'm very interested in this in the scaling, both who could finance it, which we've talked about some, but this front of actually being able to implement it strikes me as a kind of rate limiting factor too. you know, have figuring out how to have the staff who are qualified to provide all of this very hands-on training and mentorship, having employers that are willing to take on interns. What do you think it's going to look like to try to expand on some of those implementation details? Assume the financing is there, just literally the, the people and companies to participate. I think it, I think it, it looks very much like what Europe has in the works now, but with a tremendously enhanced federal uh, role. So the capacity, there's different ways of addressing the capacity challenge, but in general, in principle, the idea is that here is a very intentional, methodical, smart organization uh, that understands it. it's very self-aware and understands what it's doing organizationally and has thought very um, deliberately about culture and management. What I did not say yet in this discussion is that it's also a very entrepreneurial, business-oriented um, organization. So it takes management very seriously and it, and it has shown that it can replicate itself in different cities. So I think that it's a very promising sort of uh, position to be in. I think in principle can be met by a combination of strategies, including direct expansion of Europe's capacity. They're wonderful managers. I think they could handle a substantial amplification of their own direct hands-on role. But also importantly, to develop an ecosystem of other service providers who can work with Europe and replicate its management and organizational practices with purposeful support and training. And I, that is, in fact, a direction that Europe is, is actively pursuing as we're, as we're speaking. So similarly, you can, in principle, envision building coalitions and communities across employers and, and, and employer organizations to leverage the corporate capacity. Europe is remarkable because its founder is a Harvard Business School 
trained tech entrepreneur who did very well in business and then just cashed out and decided to make a difference through Europe. So they know and understand the corporate world very well. They, they have close relationships with the CEOs of a great many Fortune 500 companies. Then you look at the White House and you think about the power that the Council of Economic Advisors and OMB and, and many of the people that the Biden administration has in place now are very savvy and skilled people in, in workforce issues and would be great partners in reaching out to and helping to coordinate a national mobilization of, of corporate America to not only help solve inequality and create opportunities for young adults who need opportunity, but frankly, also for the good of the uh, economy that we have critical skill gaps. We're looking at declining college uh, graduation uh, numbers over, over the next 10 years. And the nation needs this motivated, skilled workforce that's going to be able to start in mid-skill level positions and then, and then go back to school and, and climb into higher levels of, 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 of careers. The job sectors for at least this study focused on a handful of things. It seemed like finance and IT were really the types of jobs that were driving a lot of the, the impacts, but I don't know, not everybody wants to work in finance and IT and there's probably some limit in how many of those positions the world needs. Are there other sectors that you think are ripe for this type of program to plug into? Yes, and my understanding is that Europe and other other so-called sectoral programs are, are thinking hard about this. In general, you're looking for occupations that have pretty good projected demand. I potentially projected the supply, labor supply problems, and which offer a pretty good layer of entry-level positions that don't genuinely require four years of preparation in, in a college program. So healthcare is a field that's that's typically mentioned, advanced manufacturing, and even some more traditional jobs, traditional businesses that are growing, say, um, in retail and services may be, may be appropriate because, as you said, you don't assume that everyone is either interested or, or ready to go into a high-octane tech industry job. The effects varied quite a bit by, by city. The average quarterly increase was something like 2000 bucks, but the, the range across the cities was anywhere from a $1,000 bump to a, a $5,000 per quarter bump. What do you think is causing those differences across the cities? Well, first of all, there were a couple of outliers. Most of them were in a somewhat tighter band than that. The quick answer is we can't be sure. The longer answer is there's a lot of, a lot of factors that could be involved. Most notably, the fact that the star performer was in West Coast City with a high tech industry and a lot of very high salaries sort of suggests that local labor markets and local occupational mixes and local wage rates have have a certain amount to do with it. The populations vary as well. So some, some offices may be in areas where young adults are struggling more and have more barriers, more challenges. There's less developed support service infrastructure, maybe the local education, uh, high school, post-secondary uh, institutions aren't as strong. And then uh, third, this is a hard program to deliver. And so, you know, offices, Europe, all of the offices that we visited and, and, and studied in this project delivered Tremendous impacts. I mean, any of the office's impacts compare really favorably to the best impacts that have been uh, seen in other programs. As one senior Europe executive told me once, you know, you know, it's a sort of uncertain chemistry. You're always working with the sort of untouchable ingredients in what produces a, a strong staff team and what it is that binds together a complicated set of processes in into a strong product. Last question, David. Y'all are releasing this major report on this five-year checkpoint of, of results. What are your hopes for what happens next as the report is released and these learnings are shared? Well, 
I would love to see the Biden administration take these findings and think hard about what a program like Cure Up could do if it were writ larger. And I would love to have them have a series of intensive working meetings with Europe staff, Europe executives, to share what Europe has been doing with its programs and its its own efforts since the, the version of the program that we study, because Europe has an outstanding and very creative and very promising array of initiatives that it's developed to tackle some of the hard questions about scaling, like, well, we can't do it all. But what would it take to equip other organizations to do what we're doing as well as, you know, as well as they do it? What would it take to develop hundreds of thousands of internships a year? These are the kinds of questions and challenges that I think we have demonstrated at a reasonably decent scale here are solvable, but really moving it, moving it to a national level and beginning to meet a greater share of the tremendous need that's there, especially with the pandemic and all the additional disconnection that it's created uh, is very important. So I think, it's a, I think it's a great moment for this study to be coming out. It adds to a literature that's pointing in a particular direction. We've, we're finally starting to uh, really know that we've got traction with this set of approaches. And I would love to see these programs assume a, a leadership role in the uh, national policies and uh, national programs. David, thanks so much for joining the podcast. This has been really great. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you very much. I want to thank you for sinking into the material and very thoughtful questions. There's a lot of mystery still. That's what keeps us uh, getting up every day and, and going back to work. <laughs> Thanks for taking a deep dive with 30,000 Leagues. This podcast was hosted by David Yoakum, director of the Policy Lab at Brown University and produced by Kelly Harris Crawley and David Yoakum. You can find more conversations at 30,000leagues.com or by subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts. Keep safe, keep calm, and narwhal on. <laughs>